My great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Kaya Yashinska, a good friend and colleague of mine uh, who I've known for quite some time now. Uh, so Kaya is a, a fellow Canadian like myself. Uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Dr. Laura Ann Petito, uh, before she then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Haskins Laboratories in New Haven, Connecticut, which is uh, where we met each other. Uh, our desks were actually right next to each other in what we named uh, the Canadian pod of desks, which we appropriately decorated with maple leaves and other memorabilia. <laughs> um, Following her time at Haskins, uh, Dr. Yashinska then uh, worked at the University of Delaware for a couple of years as a faculty member there before making her way back to Canada, uh, where she is now at the uh, University of Toronto in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development. Uh, and in her work, uh, Dr. Yashinska uses neuroimaging techniques such as FNIRS, which you'll hear about today, uh, to address questions related to reading and language development, uh, especially in populations of children in low income settings and low resource settings. And today you'll hear about some of the important work she's been doing to address challenges in the field of global literacy development. Uh, and I think it really has the, the potential to make meaningful change in, in policy uh, with respect to reading uh, and literacy education. Uh, so thank you so much to our speaker and welcome. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's really happy. I'm really happy to uh, connect with you in this really wonderful initiative that um, that you guys have uh, organized. And uh, yes, we did indeed have a Canada pod and we had the Canadian flag that these are all truths about the way Jeff and I did our postdocs together. It was a lot of fun. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you about understanding uh, the reading brain and what we've really learned from some of the FNIRS uh, research studies underway. Um, and I'm going to extend some of that and talk about how we can apply the techniques and, and those tools of, of educational neuroscience in low resource settings to better understand uh, child development in global context. Now, no other species learns to read. Reading is uniquely human. And this is because reading is largely based on our most quintessential human ability, arguably our most quintessential human ability, which is language. Now, reading depends on language. But unlike language for which we have this innate predisposition for, reading must also be explicitly taught, right? So teaching reading is in fact one of our sustainable development goals under the quality education mandate. So it's goal 4.6 to be exact. Um, and the, the goal is as stated by 2030, so not even 10 years from now, ensure that all youth and a substantial portion of adults, both men and women, achieve literacy and numeracy. We have a ways to go to meet this goal. And what I want to show you today is that we can use cognitive neuroscience and educational neuroscience more specifically to understand uh, learning to read and support learning to read in a range of very diverse contexts. So what have we learned so far about the reading brain uh, from, from the lab? Cognitive neuroscience research has taught us a great deal. We know that there's a typical developmental trajectory for reading, that children progress from uh, pre-readers to emergent readers before they arrived at skilled and fluent reading. And before a child even begins to learn to read, they're already a proficient user of a spoken language. So that means that they know that the sound patterns correspond with some semantic uh, representation. So they know this relationship between sound and meaning, between phonology and semantics. Now, an emergent reader is working on sounding words out letter by letter when they're learning to read. If any of you have seen little children learning to read, uh, primary school children learning to read, it's a very laborious process where they're mapping, actively mapping letters onto sounds and decoding. Um, and uh, over time, as a child becomes a more skilled reader, they learn to make these associations much more directly. So there's this direct mapping between the semantics and the orthography or the writing system. Now, According to a set of theories uh, collectively known as triangle models, we can define reading as a set of distributed processes over these domains of orthography, phonology, and semantics. Now, over the course of reading development, different language and cognitive skills come to support that process. So for instance, really early on in reading, uh, it's, uh, the children rely very much on phonological information, phonological awareness, so that awareness and ability to manipulate the sounds of their language uh, to uh, decode, but other skills like vocabulary come to play a greater role over time. 
Reading also has a characteristic neurodevelopmental trajectory. The reading brain is characterized by activation that's largely left hemisphere uh, in regions like the uh, inferior frontal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus, supermarginal, and the uh, visual word form area. And in fact, there's a lot of overlap in processing spoken and written language. So what you can see in the figure here is um, uh, green, uh, green indicates regions that are only processing speech, blue only processing print, and pink are regions that process both, right? So you see a lot of overlap between the existing language network and one that becomes part of the reading network. Now, reading isn't innate, as we've said. It takes root in the brain over time and uses existing systems uh, in order to acquire this highly specialized um, skill. Now, before we dive into what we've learned from FNIRS on reading development, I just want to take a moment to uh, give you a quick explanation of what this technology is for any that are not familiar. And apologies if you are all very highly familiar with FNIRS. FNIRS is highly comparable to fMRI in that it measures the hemodynamic response, so change in blood flow and blood oxygenation that's related to neural activity. But in, in, unlike fMRI, that uses magnetic properties to do so, it does this using the differential absorption of light. And the premise is really quite elegant and, and, and quite simple. Uh, uh, so we place a cap on a participant's head and we shine a series of lights onto the scalp that will penetrate the tissue. Now, tissue that's really rich in oxygen will, will be a, a brighter in color, more red in color, and tissue where that oxygen is now depleted is a little bit more blue in color. And so if you shine light in and measure how much of that light is absorbed, you effectively can tell the color of the tissue underneath and infer from that the oxygen concentration and the changing ox oxygen concentration levels in those sites, uh, which gives you an indicator of neural activity. So that's how this technique works. It's very portable, and you'll see how I've, I've leveraged the portability of this technique uh, to address some outstanding questions in reading uh, science. So, what makes a reading brain? Where does this circuit even come from? To answer this, we looked at kids who were not yet uh, formally exposed to reading. So they, were, they hadn't yet started school, um, they, they weren't learning to read just yet, and we looked at changes in the left hemisphere language network, that, that network that's so important for processing language, as children made the transition from being preliterate, so having not had any reading exposure, formal reading exposure yet, to uh, emergent readers. I'm going to put some study details in the, in the box here, so you can see we had uh, pre-readers who were four and five, and an older group of kids, six and seven, they did an F nearest near imaging task where they were asked to listen and read words and pseudo words. Now, here's what we found. For young pre-readers, right? So kids who are not yet formally exposed to reading, when they were listening to spoken language, they showed really robust bilateral STG activity. You're seeing the left hemisphere here, but the activation was, was bilateral, which is very consistent with processing uh, spoken language. Now, when the older group of kids, right, a, a year or two older, when they were doing the identical task, listening to spoken language, these children actually showed additional recruitment of the left inferior frontal gyrus, right? So the task is the same. They're both doing a spoken language processing task. But after uh, uh, some reading experience and uh, some, some development, uh, being of an older age, children show this very uh, additional pattern, which looks quite like the pattern when we looked at how their brains processed uh, printed, print. Um, so, there's this, so there's this great similarity between these two. Um, and it, it appears that that neural activation for spoken language, it changes over development in response to reading experience um, and in response to, you know, just, just growing and, 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 and the biological uh, maturation. Now, can that preliterate brain, knowing that it's going to change as a function of reading experience and development, can that preliterate brain tell us something about a child's future reading ability? And this is really a critical question because we are all very familiar with the fact that many struggling readers are not identified early. And so they fail to receive interventions at a time in their development when that intervention might be maximally beneficial. So we set out to systematically examine what, if anything, about that preliterate brain would predict future reading skill. So we had again another group of pre-readers, four and five year, years old. We followed these children from, from one year 
after they had begun a formal reading instruction and they did a, a similar Afnir's task where they were listening uh, to words um, and pseudo words. So we looked more at the uh, language network activation in these pre-readers using a psychophysiological interaction analysis or PPI. Now these PPI analyses allow us to examine which regions in the brain would increase their connection with each other when they're processing spoken language specifically. And what we found was that the left and right hemisphere hubs were connected for these kids. Now, let me tell you the interesting part about the study. We followed these, these pre-readers for one year after they had begun formal reading instruction, so after kindergarten, and we tested them on various reading outcomes like uh, Woodcock-Johnson, letter, word decoding, and, and, and other tasks. And here I'm showing you um, the results of a stepwise regression that we did, predicting letter word decoding at time two from some demographic, behavioral, and neural predictors. Here's the uh, interesting part. It turns out that the connectivity in the pre-reading brain was a significant predictor of reading scores. Rather than overall activity in some of those regions that are important for the language and future reading circuit, it was, the, it was the connectivity between them, right? Um, and to the best of my knowledge, this is the earliest age with children as young as four, uh, where we've established this predictive relationship between the brain and future reading outcomes. Now, the findings support this idea of an interactive specialization uh, theory of cognition. So a cognitive skills, complex cognitive skills like reading, they develop through interactions uh, and in multiple pathways among these different brain regions. But over time, some optimal neural network for reading will emerge that's based on both the various processing biases of those pathways. So for instance, the SDGs processing bias for phonological information, as well as experience with external input, like experience with language and with print or, or reading instruction. So basically those regions that make up the reading network they undergo specialization through their increasing integration with other brain structures in response to experience, right? Experience being the really key part here. Now, once a child is a emergent reader, they still have a ways to go. So how, do they, how does a child become a skilled and fluent reader? So this is some of even earlier work that, that uh, we had done. Um, but here we're looking at children that now a little bit older, six to eight, so in that emergent stage of reading, and another uh, group of children who are nine and 10 and a much more skilled uh, stage of, of their reading development. Now, we used F nearest neuromaging again, and we looked at how children process different word types that exploit processing uh, differences among the domains of phonology, orthography, and semantics. So we had children reading regularly spelled words like dog that sound like they look, and irregularly spelled words, which English has a ton of, like debt, and pseudo words as well. Now, in our emergent readers, we compared the patterns of activity across these two different word types. And what we found is that emergent readers they don't tend to differentiate much between these word types. So the way their brain is processing regular spellings and irregular spellings is more or less the same, although for these irregular words, there's maybe a little bit more uh, super marginal activity. Now, for the exact same uh, task and the exact same uh, condition, among our skilled readers, what we see in fact is much greater activity in the left inferior frontal gyrus for these irregularly spelled words relative to regularly spelled words. Now, here's why this is interesting, right? We know that as children develop uh, uh, better reading skills, as they become more skilled, as they become more fluent, they no longer rely on a, on a heavy phonological mediation to, uh, to read. They're not sounding words out letter by letter anymore. They, they're becoming, they're uh, starting to read more, more like adults and recognizing words directly from their lexicon. Now the left inferior frontal gyrus is one of the regions in the brain that's implicated in lexical access. And so here we're seeing activity in a, in a region of the brain that's associated with that developmental stage of reading. So a focal brain correlate of a developmental reading milestone. We additionally did uh, some uh, data-driven partial least squares analyses. So it's a data-driven approach that really corroborated uh, what we found in our, our GLM models. Now, in the PLS uh, analysis, what we have is, as an outcome is a series of latent variables that best relate neural activity with our experimental manipulation. So in this case, the conditions, 
the regular, regular words and the two groups, the younger emergent and the older, more skilled readers. And what we find here is that the patterns of neural activity across the brains of older, more skilled readers really differentiate these word types, right? So you could see that the um, that there's a lot of difference for the skilled readers in the white bars, but not much um, between those emergent readers, right? So this neural trajectory uh, for from becoming an uh, emergent reader and transitioning to a more skilled reader is something we really need to understand a lot better if we're to support this transition and figure out when and how to intervene when necessary. But up until now, we've largely assumed that the journey to literacy takes place in a classroom like this, right? So kids between four and 10, where the majority of that reading development is happening that I've shared with you are learning in this types of, these types of contexts with resources, a well-trained teacher, uh, et cetera. But the reality is, is that the journey to literacy more often looks like this in very poorly resourced and overcrowded classrooms with children of all ages that are trying to learn at the same time. And we really know next to nothing about how reading happens and how the neural system for reading takes shape under these conditions, which unfortunately apply to the majority of the world's children. This is a rarity, right? This is, this is a rarity. This is the norm. Um, and we, we, we know very little about it. There's clearly a literacy crisis globally, and the cause and consequence of this is poverty, right? Because if you look at the maps of literacy and poverty in the world, they're almost perfectly inversely correlated. So what if you find yourself learning to read in one of these environments that uh, comes with or uh, comes, uh, comes with a, a high risk of, a, of a literacy? Uh, when you have an absence of access to quality of education, um, in a new language, remarkably many children in the world are learning to read in a language they don't actually speak um, at different ages. The age at which a child starts school can be incredibly varied. So first grade classrooms can contain kids between four and 10 years of age, all at very different stages developmentally, all trying to learn the same material at the same time and without adequate family and community resources to support that that process? These are all outstanding questions. So I've been exploring this and examining these um, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ivory Coast. So I want to tell you a little bit about this country where I've been doing uh, this work. So the literacy rate in Cote d'Ivoire is, uh, is quite low. It's hovering always around 50%. Um, primary school enrollment has steadily increased, although not all children are attending school uh, consistently. Um, and there's still almost a million children who are out of school. And I think this, this 800,000 is a, is a fairly conservative estimate, right? So if kids aren't attending school regularly or they altogether don't go, where are these kids, right? If you've been uh, following some news from time to time, you might've come across some studies about child labor and cocoa agriculture in West Africa. So a lot of the kids who are trying to learn to read in this context are uh, vulnerable child laborers in cocoa agriculture. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is responsible for over 40% of global cocoa production. However, cocoa farmer income uh, remains uh, often below that poverty line set at uh, $1.9 US per day. And we estimate at least 1.4 million Ivorian children between five and 14 are involved in some child labor. And this includes hazardous uh, activities like carrying heavy loads, cutting trees, um, setting fire, to the rubbish in the in the camps and the plantations and manipulating chemical products. For instance, you have an example of a child here who's got a pesticide backpack on his head. It's a little backpack with a spray nozzle. Uh, this is one of the pictures I took in one of our, our field sites. So this is very common. So how does a child learn to read in this environment that, that has this high risk of illiteracy? This is really a question about how the brain does it, right? Is development delayed? Does the way a 10-year-old learning to read for the first time learn to read in the exact same way a six-year-old does just later? Or is development somehow different, right? There's a lot has changed uh, between age six and 10 that might in fact shape those pathways into literacy for their older child. Now, um, normally we have two things that are happening at once. Um, Children are going to school, they're exposed to literacy and literacy instruction, and they're growing. There's biological maturation. These two things are, are coupled. 
um, and we can't take them apart. But the context of Cote d'Ivoire uh, provides us an ability to actually look at these things separately, to look at how the absence of reading experience or reading experience at different ages actually helps to construct that, that circuitry to make this um, process happen. So it allows us to really answer some outstanding theoretical questions about child development and the role of, of experience, as well as very practical information, it gives us a lot of very practical information. Because if we know some of the answers to our questions, we can develop interventions and design curricula with more precision uh, for these older first time readers. Here's what I mean by these older first time readers. If we assume reading development is happening in these kind of age ranges, right? However, first formal literacy exposure in high income countries tends to be, you know, kindergarten, first grade. This is when children first start encountering print formally. But in low and middle income countries, that first formal literacy exposure might not happen until much later. It can be varied for, for different children, and it can be very inconsistent, right? Uh, so not all children might get reading experience, reading instruction every day. They might miss some years of schooling, resume schooling later, uh, so on and so forth. But if we're assuming that kids across these two contexts, high-income countries and LMICs, are learning to read in the same way, then we're really making assumption about learning being the same across development. But as developmental scientists, we know this is not going to be the case, right? For example, consider some of those ingredients for literacy, sensitivity to phonological information, that sound structure that's so important for mapping letters onto sounds, that sensitivity to phonological information diminishes as you get older, right? At peak sensitivities early in life, not later. But for instance, vocabulary continues to grow so that the ingredients is that recipe for reading might change because of that different availability of those ingredients at different ages. So in the last five weeks, five, almost five years, yes, in the last five years, on my exactly to February, exactly five years, we've been doing this work in Cote d'Ivoire. So I'm going to just tell you about some of the few things we've done. I'm not going to go into depth in the, in the whole study. I'm going to focus on the reading and, and neuroimaging portions. Um, we have a series of different assessments that we do. Here you could see uh, my postdoc, uh, Fabrice Tano, um, who's doing one of the reading assessments with, with a boy. This is the early um, grade reading assessment, the EGRA, and it's a timed uh, letter, word, and pseudo word reading task. So I'm going to show you what we, what we find, right? So we ask children to read these letters in one minute, right? These are French uh, letters. Our average child, on average, children read only this many in one minute. Um, children that were from the poorest households only read this many. And children that reported doing any child labor only read this many, right? And these are, I'm talking about fifth graders. So most of these fifth grade children are not able to decode letters yet. Um, so we wanted to understand, uh, so despite these really low uh, results, it's these shockingly, staggeringly low results that really kind of uh, cause you to pause because you really understand just how, how, how poor the, these outcomes are. Um, there's still a lot of individual difference despite these low results. Some children are doing um, better than, than others. And so we really wanted to understand why, why that was. So we set out to measure the reading brain with FNIRS. So here's what this looks like. We go to a school, it's a very typical Ivorian school. Um, you see the school courtyard, there's the um, Ivorian flag there uh, that you can see. Um, and we start setting up our lab. Uh, so this is the team putting together the laboratory, uh, getting built. And then there's Fabrice again, and with the former um, grad student Sosten, who are now ready to go and, and run the experiment. And we have happy participants. I have a little video to show you. So that a time lapse of what this looks like. You can see me running around in the pink t-shirt. Uh, one of my grad students, Joe, is running around too. You'll see her. Um, it really doesn't take long. At some point, the children realized that I set up a camera and so they all came forward. And this is how you can build a state-of-the-art neuroimaging lab in a place with no electricity and where there's no room. Um, anyway, so so that that's how we do it, and it is and it is possible. It's not um, it's not easy, 
but it is possible. And the portability of FNIRS really affords us these opportunities to expand where we do our science and address these questions. So we normally, uh, so we've been using a Shimatsu light near system that um, fits into a suitcase that we travel with as check luggage. We have 47 channels that are covering the frontal and the bilateral temporal lobes, so you get really nice coverage. And if you really want to know more about the how to go about a, um, a portable a field neuroimaging protocol, we have a, a, a Jove paper um, that I would refer you to. Okay. So what do we find? So we uh, looked at, uh, in our FNIRS protocol, we had about 50 children um, who were about 10 and a half, 11 years old. They were all pre and emergent readers. They're all fifth grade children, um, but they, they're, not, they're not at all skilled readers yet. Some are not reading um, much and some are, are, are just, you know, very little. Um, and we divided this group into poor readers, those who got less than 40% correct on that letter reading task I showed you earlier, and stronger readers who got over 60% correct on that letter uh, task. By no means are these kids strong readers, they're just the stronger ones in the group. And uh, in, we had an FNIRS task where kids uh, read words, they read pseudo words, and they also saw false fonts. So these false fonts, um, uh, Jeff knows all about false fonts because he has great papers where where he this is borrowed from his paradigm actually that um, one of his publications recent publications so false fonts have all of the kind of visual properties of actual of real letters but none of the phonology or the orthography so they're they're a great kind of control okay so here's what we find when we divide these children into two groups and compare patterns of activity across these conditions here's what I want to show you so for our stronger readers, right, we see a really characteristic reading network. You see that um, uh, for words relative to false fonts, right? So there's a lot of IFG, some STG and supermarginal activity. It's mostly left hemisphere relative to right. It looks almost exactly like the figures I showed you from our American children a few uh, slides earlier. However, our poor readers don't show this. In fact, they don't show greater activity for reading anywhere in the brain relative to false fonts. They show more activity for these false fonts, which seems to suggest a lack of sensitivity to lexicality. Now, uh, here's the interesting part. Here's what we're trying to figure out and, and why I would love some questions about this and, and, and comments and discussion from, from you guys. Um, this pattern of, of poor readers, what, the first thing we thought, hmm, how does this compare to children with dyslexia? Similarly, other poor readers. In fact, the patterns of neural activity for our poor readers are quite unlike that what we see for dyslexia. So I'm showing you a comparison, similar age, 11 year old, this is an MRI study of a, a typical readers, a control group and a group of dyslexic children with the same contrast with words versus false forms, right? And what you can see is that um, you know, strong readers are showing more left inferior frontal gyrus activity here for those uh, words relative to false fonts, quite exactly like what we see for our uh, stronger readers. Um, they're showing more uh, occipital activity for false fonts relative to words. We weren't actually measuring any activity back here, so that's why we're not, we're not seeing that. The dyslexic children, on the other hand, they're still showing greater activity for words relative to false fonts in these brain regions. The pattern of activity is more diffuse. Um, it's, it's, it's not as focal, it's not as strong, and it's a, a, a little bit more, more distributed and it includes more of the right hemisphere. And this is a very characteristic dyslexia um, pattern. That's not what we see in our poor readers. So not like dyslexia. The other, then the, the next place we thought, well, what about other pre-readers? What about other children who are in the uh, equivalent stage of reading development, right? Well, our readers don't look like pre-readers either. So what I'm showing you here is a, a different study, um, also MRI, uh, the age range about six years old here, pre-readers um, who would be at a more or less in the same stage of reading development skill-wise as our poor readers who are in fifth grade and about 11. Um, and this is a contrast uh, for uh, in red, you see regions where there's more activity for false fonts relative to words. And these pre-readers still show a little bit more activity for false fonts relative to words in the occipital cortex. They do not show more activity for false fonts relative to words in the inferior frontal gyrus, right? 
So why? <laughs> this is currently what we're trying to figure out and understand. And I want to come back to that interactive specialization theory I talked about uh, in, in the beginning of the talk. We know that complex skills emerge through experience dependent interactions among brain regions. So if the strengths of those connections between those, those hubs that are important to that reading process is dependent on experience strengthening them, then in the absence of meaningful literacy instruction well into late childhood at age 10 or 11, maybe we've missed something. Uh, so in other words, perhaps there's a sensitive period for reading, a time in development when experience is either required or at least expected uh, for optimal learning to take place. Now, one way to answer this is to supply the experience and see what impact it may have. So that's actually exactly what we did next. We intervened and we provided these kids with literacy experience. So I want to talk to you about how we can um, how we can apply educational neuroscience for, for literacy and, and take you through what we've been trying to do. The idea really being to our, leverage our research findings to design, test, and scale solutions. And the scalability is so, so important. As I've been working in uh, low and middle income country contexts and uh, collaborating uh, closely with government officials and NGOs and, and, and other organizations, Really, this is this is a, a component that I kind of missed in my in my um, kind of psychology training in, in in the U.S. and Canada. That we can we can intervene, but unless that intervention can be scaled, is cost effective, and can reach all children, there's it, there's almost no point of doing it. Unless it could be the best intervention, but if it's not scalable, then it's a, a lousy intervention. So with this in mind, and with the idea that we wanted to. Uh, apply and, and give these children reading experience, um, we set out to develop an intervention called Allo Alpha Bay. So just a little bit of background. We know cost of illiteracy for emerging e economies is really quite staggering. And what we can see from not just our data, but from PASIC results and other reports that formal schooling often fails to provide children or equip children with basic literacy skills based on a whole host of factors like for school attendance, the quality of education, the parents not being engaged. So we wanted to know how can we improve reading skills for these older fifth grade uh, illiterate children and what optimal intervention methods can be scaled. So our solution was a mobile phone based curriculum. Uh, so here's what this looks like. We gave out a simple mobile phone for each child. Um, there's Fabrice again, uh, training the parents and their children on how to use the program. And I'll just tell you what the kids do on, on, on this um, platform. The design is, is based exactly on what we've, we've found in the field in our, in our few years of work. So it's an at-home, simple phone-based design. There's no data. It's not a smartphone. There's no app. You don't need the internet. It leverages the child's language knowledge. It's adaptive. It targets appropriate skill levels. Um, so basically what kids do is like they... Uh, we use the IVR and text messaging systems together. So IVR is like when you call Verizon and they say, you know, press one for a billing, press two for, you know, uh, to talk to an agent, so press three for tech support. That's the IVR system. So we coupled the IVR system with, si with simultaneous text messaging to deliver uh, lessons, literacy lessons to these kids. So things like what hearing in the voice, what kind of, uh, what word starts with pa, pa, sha, or like, having the child uh, respond with a button press, or again, what word starts with pa, and they would receive an SMS with the words pa, sha, and lak, and they'd have to respond with a button press. So we did this in tandem with a um, Kenyan a tech company called Ineza, and my uh, co-PI, Amy Ogin, our Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon's uh, Human Computer Interaction Institute. Now, we started this and then COVID came and really derailed our, um, our study plans quite substantially. Uh, not only that, we had uh, an election in Ivory Coast that was very, um, with, with, with some violence breaking out in the country. Uh, so we had a whole host of challenges of actually um, uh, doing, doing this study. So we are on track as best as we can despite the COVID situation. And we're planning to, to collect imaging data at the end of this school year if, uh, if we can and it's safe to do so. So we have a pre and post brain imaging component and tracking a group of children who's receiving this intervention in relation to a control group. Um, 
So here's what's kind of interesting for me. Normally, when we do an impact evaluation of a, of a reading intervention or any intervention for that matter, we really ask one question. Did the intervention work? Did children's literacy rates improve by, by using this program or not? But wouldn't it be more powerful to know why it worked or why it worked for some kids but not others or why it failed? Why some kids might have responded to the treatment or resisted to the treatment, which is some of that uh, great work that I know Jeff's been doing as well. So when you combine the pre and post learning, uh, uh, pre and post learning with brain uh, measures, you can get a really powerful microscope into child uh, literacy. Now, I'm going to uh, end on one more, one more thought. This is where, where neuroscience typically happens, right? In universities, uh, hospital, research hospitals, this is what a neuroscience lab um, tends to look like, a neuroimaging lab tends to look like. These are colleagues at, at, um, at Yale, at Haskins, uh, in Joy Hirsch's lab, and this is their really beautiful FNIR setup, right? But the places where neuroscience happens creates, they create barriers to an inclusive and comprehensive science of the brain. There's social and economic barriers, cultural barriers, right? Think about who comes to participate in our studies in a university laboratory, who has the means uh, to get there, the ability to take time off work and, and drive with their children, um, who is comfortable navigating a university campus to get to the right building, was comfortable uh, if the language of the campus um, might not be the language they know it or speak at home. And so we really have uh, a lot of challenge in, in the neurocognitive neuroscience field. Neuroscience is weird. It's Western, it's educated, it's industrialized, it's rich, it's democratic. But the demand for research is universal. Demand for both basic science of, of brain development, applied science, look at solutions for children who who are struggling to learn to read, that demand for knowledge and, and innovative applications um, and, and solutions isn't weird. It's not weird at all, right? So we really have a mismatch between where science is happening and where science is needed most, right? So here's our literacy map of the world that you've seen before. And this is a distribution of scientists in the world. Again, there, we are clustered in places um, that where, we, where, where reading rates are, are really high, right? So when you look at these kind of at a global scale, you can really see the, the, the severity of the problem. Using the portable imaging techniques allows us to bridge some of, some of these gaps and head in a, in, a, in a more inclusive and comprehensive direction. It allows us uh, to, for science to meet policy. I'm gonna leave you with this uh, video here where, um, like I mentioned, I work very closely with the Ivorian government of. Um, the Ministry of Education and the Ivorian government. This is the director of the, uh, of the cabinet, um, Kone Raoul. He, uh, I work with him very closely and he said, what is this FNIRS? I want to see it, please teach me about it. So we brought the system uh, in one of our trips and set up a meeting for government um, officials, members of the Ministry of Education and other stakeholders where we actually, he was the participant, we put the cap on and we uh, showed his brain activity on a big overhead projector in a big presentation room. And so, the, so the, these are the kinds of things you can't do with fMRI. These are, fMRI is such a powerful technique, but it has limits. And the places where NEARS go really allow us to head in some uh, exciting um, and very positive directions, I'd like to think. So with that in mind, I just wanna, um, let's see. Oh, much to acknowledge, lots of collaborators and students uh, and, and colleagues and funding for some of those earlier uh, studies I showed you. And for Cote d'Ivoire specifically, we've been very fortunate to have funding from the Jacobs Foundation, uh, UBS Optimus, um, Tony Chocolone, which is a chocolate company that's very interested in some of the work we are doing. Now the fantastic team there uh, with a lot of research assistants uh, and partners. Lastly, I'm looking for a postdoc. Uh, so if this stuff, if you're a student or you know of any students that are soon to graduate and this this is uh, interesting to you, please email me. Um, and with that, I just want to thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, do I, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? That is just fascinating, really fascinating, really inspiring. That's good to hear. Yeah, it's, it's hard work.
um, you know, because it's 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 so much easier to run studies uh, in, in a lab here where you could just like recruit from the community around you. Um, and you don't, I don't need to like, I'm starting a project in Canada and I'm, it's so easy. I'm like, oh, I don't have to like set up a meeting with the Ministry of Education to do this. I can just <laughs> recruit from the community. It's so straightforward. Now, did I understand you right that you you don't need a steady um, supply of electricity in order to collect this information? No, so it's battery powered. Uh, so I have a system that, and we just bought additional batteries. And then we, when we go to our um, our residence in the in the evening, we just charge those. We also have a diesel generator for backup. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually have all of that sort of on hand, um, but where it's entirely self sufficient. So um, we bring every, everything we need uh, to, to do the study with us. And then we, we set it up every morning and take it down every afternoon. Wow. And is there an issue with head movement with FNRS? Um, it's, it's not as sensitive as MRI, right? Because the, 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 the spatial scale is, is not as precise as fMRI, right? So, so kids move. Uh, but for one, the cap moves with them when they do, if it's positioned well, and it's well secured. Um, so it, you're not getting that the same kind of uh, issues when you would in, 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 in scanner and having to correct for, for motion um, to the same degree. It, it's an, it's an issue, but it's, it's very workable. I will say that, um, the participants we have in Cote d'Ivoire are the most still lovely, wonderful children I have ever worked with. So it looks like there's a few questions coming up in the chat here. I don't know, Kaya, if you can see I that. See the chat, actually. Sorry. Uh, so I'll just go. I'll, I'll go back. And uh, Louisa had a question asking whether you are tracking behavior in the children's responses during the intervention. Yeah. So we're in the intervention. We're tracking. Um, you know. So we did. Uh, you know, a baseline like comprehensive language, cognitive, and and reading uh, battery. We were set to do a midline um, in the uh, in the fall, which we couldn't because of COVID and the election. So we developed a phone based uh, midline. My students in my lab, oh my gosh, they did fantastic work developing this phone based assessment. We actually assessed literacy using like text messaging and, and calls mm -hmm. to some of our participants, and it it somehow magically worked. Um, so and then we will do uh, a, an in person end line at the end of this academic year, if all if all is well to, to, to do that. So, you know, we have to kind of closely monitor the situation. Um, our kids are now in sixth grade. So the intervention started when they were in fifth. We wanted to evaluate at the end of last year and then do uh, kind of follow-ups during sixth year, um, their sixth grade. So they're going to finish primary school this year. And once they do, they will disperse and we won't be able to <laughs> track them. So I'm really hopeful we're gonna be able to to do that, but uh, COVID's uh, certainly really complicated that. But yes, we are measuring so many things. Um, and then the platform tracks, at, you know, logs every bit of data. So how much they spend on the platform, when they call, what questions they complete, how many lessons, what their scores are, um, so on and so forth. So it's a very, there's a lot of very rich log data that um, is complementary to what we collect um, in terms of the baseline and line assessments. And there's, there's another question here from Armin about um, connectivity, whether you looked at whole brain connectivity or did you really look at the sort of these specific uh, yes. that you were investigating? Yeah, that's that's coming, right? Because based on the, the findings we had about connectivity being really this important component rather than just overall activation um, and, and in line with this interactive uh, specialization theory, I think connectivity is going to be uh, our most powerful insight into um, into the, the the reading networks that do or do not form for these kids, and that's 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 slotted. That is hopefully what um, the postdoc that I will hire will get a chance to. Work <laughs> and uh, I had a, a question as well about um, the the false font finding. Um, so right. your, your, your thoughts about the role of visual attention in that specifically and, and sort of are you looking at attention and executive function in some of the, the uh, evaluations that you're doing? Yes, we have. So, right. So some of those kids, let me I just go back to where we had this uh, false font finding. 
Um, oh, sorry. I don't mean to scroll like this. We could just do it this way. There we go. So um, yeah, we have a, a, a executive function battery that's um, a part of this assessment. And so, you know, presumably some of the children are poor readers because uh, some attentional uh, uh, deficits, per, uh, perhaps, or just individual differences in their ability to ma maintain attention. Um, so some of these, the kids who are poor readers in this group are poor readers for, can be poor readers for a number of reasons, right? They could be poor readers because they were the ones who more sporadically attended school. And so they were just missing out on more education. They were the ones who had more uh, demands um, on their time in terms of agricultural work and other kind of household um, uh, demands, I guess. They could be the children. Some of these children presumably have dyslexia, right? If we assume that the uh, incidence rate uh, in, in, in North America is, is going to be comparable elsewhere in the world, um, presumably some of these children might have dyslexia that we just don't know of. Um, some of these children might have attentional uh, disorders or deficits. So there's, it's, it's, it's hard to understand, to pare, like pare down and understand the, the sources of all the variants in this, in, in this result. And, and a question related to that as well is the, the, the role of dual language experience in this too. Uh, do you think that that's uh, playing a role here? So all of these kids are bilinguals, right? So I didn't, I didn't mention that, but yes, they're all bilinguals. <laughs> they all speak some Ivorian language at home. Uh, most of these kids also, they have, you know, members of their household that speak, uh, speak French, um, but they're all speaking the local language at home and they're all educated in French. So now they're at fifth grade. So their French skills are pretty good because they've been in school for, for at least five years and many of them more because, um, uh, grade repetition rates are so high. A lot of kids have actually been in school for much longer than five years. Um, so they're all, they're all, you know, kind of early exposed, like childhood, early childhood exposed French speakers. But we do find that that makes a difference. So we have a related paper um, that one of the uh, students in my lab is, is working on that she's revising. So hopefully it'll be um, uh, published uh, later this year, um, where we compare really the impacts of having a, a French language member, um, household member, so having some bilingualism in the home to not, and we see a lot of positive associations with that as well. Um, very much corroborating a uh, lot of literature on, on this topic already about the, the benefits of, of early bilingualism for, for phonological processing and, and for reading. Right, right, thank you. Uh, so there's a few more here in the chat. Uh, one question about whether uh, hair color would impact uh, anything to do with the measurements that you're taking. Yeah, somebody just somebody just had a. I just responded to somebody with this exact question on Twitter. Uh, skin color, no, no issue whatsoever. I'm unsure what the origin of this idea. I, I mean, I could speculate, but the origin of this idea that skin color would significantly compromise the ability to collect the state to collect nearest data. Um, you do see a difference in terms of those the, for those that are more familiar with um, FNIRS imaging and have done it. You the, the power of the the light um, can be adjusted uh, to improve the signal to noise ratio, and often this is a, an automated process in in the software of the of the system that you use. So I'll notice that the powers tend to be higher for darker skin versus lighter skin, but the the signals is, itself are 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 fine. Um, the data is very clean hair is very problematic and it doesn't really matter what the color of the hair is it's just the hair is is very problematic so it doesn't matter if it's light colored hair uh as well, if it's if it's thick and there's a lot of it and it's underneath the, the the probe you you don't get any um signal really the other thing that i think um doesn't receive nearly enough attention for some reason there's a lot, a lot more questions always about the the skin color I think it's school thickness. I think some people just don't give good signal because we're looking for those light is going to scatter in, in the in the dense medium, like the skull and the and the cortex and all of that. Um, and I think some people just have different school thickness varies across the the skull and varies, you know, across genders and uh, with age. And I think that is probably one of the biggest um, impediments to collecting good nearest data because some people, even if they have no hair, <laughs> you cannot get a good signal off their head. And I don't know what could be besides that, because we're that would just increase the depth, 
that your nearest um, light would have to penetrate in order to do any meaningful recording. Uh, but with these with these children, um, no, we 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 don't have uh, we didn't have any issues. And you probably saw in the in the photos most kids um, have very short hair. They're they're they get haircuts very frequently. So we just didn't we didn't have any issues. This is the the best signal quality that has come out of my lab in the last five years is is from this population. And uh, there's yeah. another uh, comment specifically, uh, more of a comment about uh, the use of dynamic functional connectivity analysis and uh, and methods like ICA to look at uh, some of this. And and perhaps I, I know you had mentioned sort of the, some of the data driven methods that that you've been using for this kind of work. Whether you might be able to speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think that's a those are all good ideas. I haven't I haven't explored it yet fully, mostly because we've been so caught up in trying to accommodate and adjust uh, research for the pandemic. I think a lot of labs are have been struggling with that and everyone's sort of veered off course and reprioritized just adapting the methods in the in the last couple of years. So some some of the, the I think those ideas are are really good and I really just need to get a postdoc to come in and and um, work on that with me. That's the goal. <laughs> Are there other questions or comments out there? I had a really, really basic question. Um, this is sort of working within the French language. I know there's been a lot of work looking at the difference between languages that have letters versus languages that are, are more complicated, like syllabic, like. Chinese and Japanese, would you expect the same sorts of developments age wise, or would you expect it to be different? Yeah, so, and there, so there, there is, we've done, we've done some work uh, when I was a doctoral student in Lorraine's lab where we actually compared uh, Spanish, English, and French, English bilinguals with English monolinguals. So, exactly looking at some of that uh, orthographic variation, Spanish being extremely transparent, English being not at all transparent, um, and then French being somewhere in the middle. French is interesting in the sense that it's um, very transparent from print to speech, but from speech to print, it is more opaque. Uh, so I think there's some interesting manipulations one could do to look at that, uh, that directionality. Um, we do find that there's some influence. So, for instance, kids who are, are Spanish kids in that study who are reading in a, uh, their first language of literacy was, was Spanish in a very transparent language. They showed more STG activity um, when reading relative to English monolinguals of the same age, presumably because reading in a very transparent orthography uh, relies, can rely much more on phonological uh, mediation because you can just sound words out letter by letter. And so there isn't that same kind of pressure to maybe, maybe I don't know if that would be the right way of casting it, but there isn't the same kind of orthographic pressure to, to uh, uh, access things directly from the lexicon because they're irregularly spelled, right? And so we saw more activity for, for those kids in the SDG to region involved in phonological processing, presumably reflecting that it, like uh, uh, preferential weighing towards uh, phonological processing when reading in a, a transparent language. I assume we did not find strong, strong differences between um, English and 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 French um, in in this in that study. I assume that there, there might be some contributions. Um, uh, but it's it's yeah, it's a it's a really great question because we do know that this you know, does have, there is some influence of the first language of reading on reading in the second. Having said that, much of what happens in terms of the reading brain is fairly universal, right? So even children who are learning to read in a uh, logographic system like Chinese, very much rely on phonological information. Phonological awareness is a robust predictor for reading in, in, in kids whose orthography ostensibly doesn't, you know, encode phonology in, in, in the same way. So I think some of those uh, are largely universal, and then this the kind of the secondary level is that there is some L1 influence on the L2. Fascinating, thanks.
It looks like we're right at two o'clock. Um, so I just wanted to uh, say a big thank you uh, for, for joining us today and, and telling us all about this fascinating work. And uh, there is a, a Slack channel that we can um, create for this, uh, this session, uh, if you would be willing to um, answer if, if folks have questions afterwards that they would like to, to post on that. Yeah, I have it. I, I, I set up the, the in my Slack. I'm on it. <laughs> for, thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Jeff. This was really nice. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you all for everyone for attending today. I hope you have a good rest of the day.